OK, so uh, uh, my job is to tell you something about neutrino masses. And in particular, what I want to try to do is to convince you that the discovery of neutrino masses is a big deal. I want to try to uh, give you a sense of what it is that theorists are very excited about. And then I'll also give you a sense of uh, that we have lots of things we don't understand, and we need a lot of help from experiment. So that's kind of, the, that's kind of my job. So just to get started, just to remind everybody, Something very exciting happened about 20 years ago. It's funny that's about 20 years ago. I was actually thinking about this now. And uh, there might be undergraduates in the room that were born uh, after the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which is very depressing for me. But anyway, that's a different story. So, so the key thing is that we've discovered that neutrinos can change flavor. That phenomenon depends on the baseline, and it depends on the neutrino energy. The evidence for this is absolutely overwhelming. We don't discuss whether this is true or not anymore. And we're even absolutely sure that the only explanation for all of these phenomena is that neutrino masses are not zero. So this is a really big deal discovery that happened about 20 years ago. And we've been in the process of figuring out what's going on since then. And we still have a lot of work to do. So again, this is a really big discovery. Neutrinos have non-zero masses. We did not know that 20 years ago. If you pick up uh, uh, Peskin and Schroeder, for example, uh, they don't talk about neutrino masses. Or maybe they do in a very speculative way. Neutrino masses are also known to be very, very small. So this plot here on the left-hand side is a plot of all of the fermion masses in the standard model in a log scale. And the one thing you should be absolutely amazed by is the fact that all fundamental fermion masses in the standard model span about 12 or 13 orders of magnitude, which is an absolutely ridiculous statement if you've never thought about this. I will come back to this at the very end. But again, why do we really care about the fact that neutrino masses are not zero? It's because they weren't supposed to be not zero. This was a surprise. We had this very nice prediction that we could have made, again, 20, 25 years ago, that the neutrino masses were exactly zero. This was a stable result. It did not get quantum corrections. It was a great prediction, and it almost works, except that it's wrong. It almost works because the masses are very small. It's wrong because they're not zero. I want to try to give you a sense of why we think this means something important and not just an extra parameter of particle physics. So these are the elementary particles of particle physics. As you know, they don't exactly look like that. Uh, for example, the quarks come in three colors, for example. But other than that, uh, you've all seen this before. And I want to remind people, especially the younger people, is that this is not just a pretty picture. This is a model. And it's an amazingly successful model. It's the result of a lot of decades of research in particle physics. It is the marriage of quantum mechanics and special relativity. And it's also an amazingly predictive model. And again, this is aimed at the young people and the people who don't think about particle physics on a daily basis. Again, it's the type of model that if I tell you what are the ingredients of the model, and if I tell you what the rules are, you can write down the model and you can make all the predictions yourself. There's a finite number of free parameters you have to measure. That's what the experiments are for. Uh, but that's it. I mean, you can make all the predictions you want. And the key point is, if you took all of the ingredients that we knew about, and if you used all the rules that we knew, you would come up to this prediction that neutrino masses are zero. So if you want neutrino masses to not be zero, you have to change something. You either have to add more ingredients, or you have to change the rules. The reason I'm giving this talk here is because uh, uh, we don't know what these new ingredients are. We have a really good sense of what these ingredients could be. And again, theorists have a lot of time on their hands, so they can come up with lots of different ideas. And we only talk about the ideas that work, because the ones that don't work, we don't talk about because they don't work. So there's a lot of different choices of which new ingredient we have to add to the standard model of particle physics to give neutrinos a mass. But we don't know which idea is right, if any of them. So we need more guidance from experiment. So let me summarize again of where we are. We've discovered non-zero neutrino masses. They are telling us that we have to change our model of fundamental particle physics in a non-trivial way. And I will discuss some examples in just a second. 
And I want to remind people, especially those outside of particle physics, that this is a big deal. In particle physics, we've constructed this uh, um, theoretical formalism that works ridiculously well. I think most people will tell you that it wasn't supposed to work that well when people ca came up with that about 50 years ago. So the number of things that do not fit into the standard model is very small. What I like to say is that they're small enough that they fit on a footnote of a slide, which is here. So you can read this. Uh, these are the things about the standard model that why either we only figured out very recently or that we still haven't figured out yet. It's a very short list. One is that uh, we had this phenomenon called electroweak symmetry breaking, and the LHC has revealed that the minimum Higgs idea works, which is really impressive. Uh, we have this thing called the dark matter. We have no idea what it is, but we're very sure it's not something that lives in the standard model. There's another funny question that we like to ask, which is, uh, uh, the universe has uh, too much matter in it. So we're very bold. We can predict how much matter there should be in the universe. And the answer we get is about wrong by about uh, eight orders of magnitude. So there's way too much stuff in the universe. That's good for us, but it's bad for particle physics because it means we don't understand how that happened. And finally, the, the most weird question of all is that somehow the expansion rate of the universe seems to be accelerating today and it seems to have accelerated in the past. We have no idea what leads to that. We don't even know if that's a particle physics question, but it sounds like a particle physics question, and the answer does not live in the standard model of particle physics. So these are the things we don't understand, and neutrino masses are probably the easiest one uh, uh, to tackle, and it's the one that has the least dependency on things that are coming from cosmology and astrophysics. So what is this uh, standard model with non-zero neutrino masses? We don't know. And what I like to say is it's not like we don't have any ideas. We have too many ideas. So we want to figure out which one is the right idea. And I, I think I've said this before, and this will be a theme of everything I'm going to say. We've learned a lot. We know what we have to figure out. And the answers have to come from experiment. The theorists have al already done as much work as they can do with the information that we have. And what's exciting is a lot of experiments are coming online. Let me say something about masses for those that care about masses. Particle physicists talk about mass a lot and how mass happens. I will not be able to explain to you why that's something we care about. But the answer is, has to do with this uh, Higgs mechanism. So when you hear about non-zero neutrino masses, you can say, what do neutrino masses have to do with the Higgs mechanism? And the answer is, Whatever mechanism gives the neutrinos a non-zero mass, it has to come through something like the Higgs mechanism. The reason neutrinos are exciting is that they actually have choices. So unlike all of the charged fermions and the W and the Z, in the case of neutrinos, there are non-trivial choices you can make. And here's a, a qualitative list of those, cho those choices. One is uh, you can have neutrinos get a mass just like everybody else by talking to the Higgs boson. If you want to do that, then we say that the neutrinos have to be very, very, very weakly coupled to the Higgs boson. Another possibility is that maybe there's another Higgs boson that we haven't seen yet, and maybe the neutrinos get a mass from that Higgs boson. And that would be interesting because it gives you a nice way of explaining why the neutrino masses look very different from everybody else's mass. Then there's a third possibility, which is a uh, Let's imagine that together with the Higgs boson that gives everybody a mass, there's another source of mass out there. We don't know what it is, but it's not, have, it, does, it has nothing to do with the Higgs boson, and that the neutrino masses are the marriage of the Higgs boson with this other source of mass. So this is the more complicated idea, and of course it's the one that everybody likes. Now, these ideas are all qualitatively different, but they also make predictions that are qualitatively different as well. And uh, one key prediction has to do with the nature of the neutrinos. And uh, we're going to hear a lot about this in the next talk. But the neutrinos can be either the Rack fermions or Majorana fermions. And depending on how they get their mass, they end up being either one or the other. So for us, oh, sorry, a really big deal to, to, to make progress in understanding non-zero neutrino masses is to answer that question. Are neutrinos Majorana fermions? 
And if we knew the answer to that, from a theoretical perspective, we would know which way to go as far as thinking about how neutrino masses happen. And of course, uh, we don't know the answer to this, and uh, uh, Suzanne is gonna talk about this next. And, uh, but once we know the answer, our lives will be easier. Uh, they won't be solved, because even if we knew if that neutrinos are, for example, Majorana fermions, there would still be lots and lots of possibilities for how neutrino masses happen. So I want to try to give you a flavor of what are the general ideas that we have for how neutrino masses happen uh, under different circumstances. So this is a very busy slide. Uh, the simplest way to give neutrinos a non-zero mass is to look at the standard model as an effective theory. What this, what this means is, let's pretend that the standard model describes phenomena at energy scales below something. I don't know what that something is, but above that scale, the standard model gets replaced by something else. Now, we're very good at doing this. We know how to write down these effective theories, and we also know how to guess what do these heavy degrees of freedom do at low energies. And the way that we guess that is by writing down more terms in my Lagrangian that respect our symmetries, but they look like what we call non-renormalizable interactions. Okay, so if you've never heard about, about this, don't worry about it. But the key point is, we have a way of ordering these new interactions in terms of which one is more likely to be important and which ones are less likely to be important, and we order them according to what's, what we call the dimension of the operator. And these operators come in dimensions, say, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and so on and so forth, forever. And the dimension 5 operator is supposed to be the most important one at low energies. What's really exciting is the only dimension 5 operator you can write down is this one. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But you have to trust me that this operator here was actually written down a long time ago by Weinberg. And if you had postulated that uh, this is what the new physics is doing predominantly at low energies, you can make a prediction. And the prediction is that this physics here that generates this effective operator would contribute at low energies in only one observable way. And that one observable way is that neutrinos would get a very small mass. And that neutrinos would be a Majorana fermion. So this is an amazing prediction you could have made 40 years ago. And you would have looked super smart if you had done that, because that's exactly what we observe. We observe very small neutrino masses. We don't know if they're Majorana or not, but if they were Majorana, this idea would be looking super good. And of course, uh, this was postulated by Weinberg about 40 years ago, or maybe exactly 40 years ago. And we know he's very smart, so at least all of that has been confirmed. And you can ask yourself, OK, so good. So there's a prediction I can make. But how do I know that this idea is right? And the way to test if this is right is you have to ask, what else does this do for me? And that's where the usefulness of this effective operator uh, uh, stops. I can't predict what else it can do for me because it depends very, very dramatically on what does that physics look like. One other question that we like to ask is not just what that physics looks like, but where is it? And when I say where, I mean uh, uh, mass scales. Is it some very light particle that's super weakly coupled? Or is it a super heavy particle uh, that will be really hard to see in the laboratory? So this is the picture. If you ask your theory friends, they're probably willing to bet their houses that that's the right answer. I would probably take the bet, by the way. But nonetheless, uh, how do we know that this is true? And what we like to say is that it depends on how does that operator get realized. So the simplest way of doing that is to do something that we're all familiar with. So if we want to give neutrinos a non-zero mass, a good way to do it is to add a new degree of freedom to my Lagrangian. And the degree of freedom that we're tempted to add is what's called a right-handed neutrino. And one of the reasons why neutrino masses are zero in the standard model is because they're missing a, a partner. If you think about fermion masses, a good way of thinking about that is a fermion mass is the marriage of a left-handed guy with a right-handed uh, uh, girl, maybe. But nonetheless, uh, so you need a right-handed field and a left-handed field. And they combine, and they give a mass term. 
and the neutrinos don't have a right-handed partner. So you can say, so let me just add one. And if you do that, then the neutrinos get what's called a Yukawa coupling. They can talk to the Higgs boson now, and they're on their way to getting a mass. Now what happens is these uh, right-handed neutrino degrees of freedom that we don't know if they exist or not, they're actually special degrees of freedom. Because if they exist, they can't talk to anything in the standard model except the neutrinos via this coupling here. That means that they're special, and that means that they're allowed to have a mass by themselves. So that's the term that I wrote down here. So if you postulate that right-handed neutrinos exist, this is what your new model looks like. It's a really simple model. It has a few new numbers in it, which are couplings, and it has some masses in it, which are, again are a bunch of numbers. So you can ask, what does this model here do for me? And what it does is it actually describes six massive Majorana neutrinos, which is good because we've seen three massive neutrinos, and they could be Majorana. And if we dive into this in a little bit more detail, we can ask if we can fit all of the data using this very simple model. And the answer is yes. You can do a really good job of fitting all of the data because you have these new parameters, couplings and masses, and I can adjust them in a way that the neutrinos get a non-zero mass at the end, and I can explain everything. I make a, 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 a prediction, which is there are these new states in my theory. They can be very, very hard to detect, either because they don't couple to anything very strongly or because they're super heavy. But I, I do get three neutrinos that we're very happy about. So now the question is, what values of those parameters explain all of the data? So this is where I'm starting to make a prediction now. And the problem is, we actually don't have a lot of information. So if you ask your theory friends what those numbers here could be, they will give you all kinds of answers. So this is a mass scale in the theory. So they can say, oh, maybe that's the gut scale, because the gut scale is where something exciting happens. Or maybe that's the electroweak scale, because that's where something exciting happens as well. Or maybe it's some intermediate scale where you do something called leptogenesis, about 10 to the 10 GeV. But if you look at the data, there's very, very little you can say. And I'll show you this plot. Just look at this axis here. These are possible values of this number. And we ask if we can explain the neutrino oscillation data with this number. And the answer is yes. For, for values of this number that are almost anything except this region that's excluded here. That means that my model works if this number is less than 10 to minus 10 electron volts, and it works if this number is more than one electron volt. And you can ask, where does this end? It actually ends, which is good. Uh, it ends at about 10 to the 24 electron volts. So if you're counting, that's kind of over here, or over there, or over there, okay? So this is what we can do. It's not a very well-constrained model. Okay, so I hope you're convinced of that. We can make some predictions. If they actually live here, or if they live there, we have new neutrino states that we can actually see in the laboratory, which would be super exciting. They would look like what we call sterile neutrinos. If they start living further away, they become very difficult to observe, but not impossible. You know, people are creative and they ask different questions. And my goal is not to sell you this model, but it's just to give you a sense of the challenge and what we can do with the type of information that we have access to now. Uh, one can do uh, very different things. Again, the challenge is to give the neutrinos a very small mass. Uh, the, the way that you go about this is by violating lepton number. Again, uh, Suzanne will talk about lepton number in the next talk. And uh, there are lots of theoretical choices. And uh, I'm not going to talk about this very much, other than to say that we can catalog models, and we're very good at this too, by the way, and this is a very small subset of all the models that we can come up with. Although that's not true, these are not models, these are types of models. So many, 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 many different models fall into one of these lines. And you can say, this is horrible, however, you can at least ask phenomenology questions now. One question you can ask is, if a particular model is right, where do I think the new particles live? 
And the answer is it depends a lot on the model. So this is a histogram of these models. And some models live at uh, the 100 GeV level, and other models live at the gut scale level with everything in between. So even if you don't like any of these models, at least you can say, I can test them. So if I have a bunch of new particles that live around here, I expect to see something maybe at the Large Hadron Collider. Or maybe I expect them to do something to things like uh, uh, charged lepton observables, charged lepton flavor violation, the muon G minus uh, 2, EDM searches. So it is possible that if the new physics that's responsible for neutrino masses lives here, that we can find other uh, uh, impacts of the same phenomenon there. So that's very exciting. Uh, if they live here, life is harder, maybe. But it's nice to know uh, what's the realm of possibilities. This is what one of these models looks like. It's nothing to do with the seesaw model. It's very ugly, and it's completely ruled out. So I just want to show you a picture that looks like a model. Let me talk about something that people uh, uh, often ask about, which is Dirac neutrinos. So let's go back to this Lagrangian. And let's ask what happens in a very special case, which is when all of these uh, right-handed neutrino masses are exactly zero. The first question you have to ask is, does that fit the data? The answer is yes. And what's interesting is that's actually special. If you make all those masses zero, then your Lagrangian now looks like this. And the reason this is qualitatively different and special is because if your Lagrangian really looks like this, those right-handed neutrino masses don't exist. And whenever something doesn't happen, it usually doesn't happen for a good reason. So for example, we spend a lot of time looking for proton decay. But if you believe the vanilla standard model, that doesn't happen because of a, a symmetry that we call baryon number. The reason we look for proton decay is because we're not particularly happy with that symmetry. That's not a symmetry that we asked for. It's a symmetry that happened by chance. What that means is if you add new stuff to your model, and we all think that there are new particles somewhere, maybe super heavy, these accidental symmetries are supposed to be not there. The other symmetry that's like that is called lepton number. Now, if your Lagrangian looks exactly like this, and there are no right-handed neutrino masses, then lepton number has to be an exact symmetry of nature. Right now, uh, lepton number is what we call an accidental symmetry of nature. But if that operator looks exactly like this, and, and neutrinos are exactly Dirac fermions, then we will have learned that lepton number, or for the theorists, uh, baryon number minus lepton number has to be an exact symmetry of nature. And right now, we don't know if that's true or not. Actually, we spend a lot of money trying to figure out if that's true or not. And it's a very non-trivial thing we would learn. Why don't we talk about this from, uh, you know, if you talk to your theory colleagues, why don't they explore the possibility that the neutrinos are Dirac fermions? One is that we're kind of lazy and we're convinced that Weinberg is right. The other reason is, if you want to explain neutrino masses, these numbers have to be like 10 and minus 12. Now, if you've never thought about this, you can say, OK, so what's wrong with 10 and minus 12? It's small. We don't really like small numbers. We, the people, don't like small numbers. Apparently, nature doesn't really care what we like or not. But it's an experimental question. We can still talk about uh, explaining non-zero neutrino, uh, non neutrino masses of this kind, and we can try to explain why this number is very small. And a good way of doing that is to postulate that maybe this number was supposed to be exactly zero because of some symmetry. And then that symmetry gets broken, and then that number becomes very small. So that's another kind of model that, that I'm getting electrocuted here. But. That's another kind of model that people have written down. It's a model where the neutrino yukawa coupling is also a higher dimensional operator. Because your right-handed neutrino is charged under some unknown symmetry I've never heard of before. And part of the reason this is starting to get a lot of attention now is because of dark matter. We have no idea what the dark matter is. Uh, we think it's some new particle that doesn't interact very much. 
And it kind of looks like a neutrino. So maybe the right-handed neutrino is a friend of the dark matter. Maybe it shares some interactions with the dark matter. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. And it provides you with a natural formalism for understanding what's going on with the dark matter, uh, how many dark matter particles there are, and things like that. So again, this is another logical possibility, and here the neutrinos would be Dirac fermions. And again, it comes back to this question, we need to know if the neutrinos are Dirac or Majorana fermions. I want to say one word about fermion mixing, which is uh, the other puzzle that we think might teach us something is the fact that if you look at the quark mixing matrix, it looks like this. If you look at the neutrino mixing matrix, which I won't be talking about, but there will be a session dedicated to neutrino oscillations uh, later this morning that I invite everybody to attend. We're very puzzled by the fact that these two matrices look very different. And again, theorists ask really weird questions. This is one kind of question that we ask. Why are these two matrices very different? One thing that's sociologically funny is that uh, we often like to say that this matrix here looks funny because we've grown up listening to this matrix here. But if you ask your friends uh, from the sociology department, you know, which one of those two matrices looks weird, I would argue this one is pretty weird. This one doesn't look very weird. It looks pretty vanilla, but that's a different question. Oh, come on. So how are we going to learn more? And uh, we need a lot more experiments. The types of experiments that we need are of a very large variety. We want to learn if lepton number is violated. We know that double beta decay can do it for us. We would be happy if we could do it in different ways, but we don't have any great ideas. We want to study neutrino oscillations a lot. Neutrino oscillations are the only place where neutrino masses have actually manifested themselves. That's it. We haven't seen neutrino masses anywhere else. So exploring this more is probably a very good idea. We also want to learn about charge leptons. Learning about charge leptons is important because charge leptons and neutrinos are friends. And maybe something that gives the neutrinos a mass shows up in the charge lepton sector as well. Another thing that uh, also Suzanne is going to talk about is uh, we would like to know what the neutrino masses proper are because we only measure the differences of the masses with oscillation experiments. And finally, uh, we can find out about neutrino masses from things like collider experiments, and of course from cosmology, and also Suzanne is going to talk about that. So I'm getting to the end. The main message here is that neutrino masses are a very big deal. Now, I want to emphasize this. Neutrino masses are super small, and uh, we don't know what that means. I, I like, I, I, there's a fun example of, of what does it mean that to say that neutrino masses are super small, and hopefully people will find this entertaining, and it does drive the message in an interesting way. Let's go back to the standard model of particle physics, and let's uh, do an analogy of masses for the quarks. So let's take the top quark, which is super heavy, and let's associate that with something that's also super heavy. The heaviest animal that ever lived is the blue whale. So let's make that the top quark. And it gives us a nice gauge for what the other masses should be. So for example, in these units, the bottom quark is like a very big elephant. OK, that's good. So what are the other particles we like? I like muons. So the muon has the mass of about a tiger in these units. And then of course, the electron, which is the lightest charged fermion uh, compared with the top quark, is kind of like a very small rabbit which is not so bad, like half a kilogram or something like that. So these are all of the fermions that we have, and they span all of these animals here. So the question you want to ask yourself is, what are the neutrino masses? So what's the neutrino mass like in units when the top quark is a blue whale? And the answer is a fruit fly. This is how weird neutrinos are. If you look at it this way, they're not even mammals. <laughs> so that's why we mean that this is probably interesting. The other thing I mentioned very briefly is that neutrino mixing seems to be weird. We also don't know why that is, but it probably means something important. And then the final thing, which I hope I said many, many times, is in order to make progress, we need more data. 
And a lot of data should be coming in the next uh, decade or so. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Okay, we have time for uh, some questions. And if you have a question, you can come up to one of the speakers that's uh, located in the aisle here. So start here. Uh, you mentioned several variations of beyond the standard model. One variation you propose multiple Higgs forces or boson. And that's straightforward. If an up clock has a Higgs force, if an electron has a Higgs force, the electron neutrino has a Higgs force, that makes a lot of sense. The second beyond the standard model solution you selected was you talked about some other particle giving mass to an electron neutrino. What was that other particle that you were talking about? Right, so the, the, the short answer is if you add what's called the Higgs triplet to the standard model, so it's another Higgs, and that Higgs triplet gets a very small vacuum expectation value, it has to be very small because otherwise we would know about this already. Then the Higgs triplet has quantum numbers such that it only gives masses to neutrinos. It actually gives them a Majorana mass, but the Higgs triplet cannot give a mass to anybody else. It actually gives a very tiny mass to the W and the Z as well. Uh, but that's, that, that's what I'm talking about. So it's a different, a different Higgs-like object. Okay, but it's still a Higgs-like particle. Correct, yeah, but it's a second one. It's not the one that we know about. Also about the list of things that are not described within the standard model, why did you leave out the muon magnetic moment discrepancies for the electron and also some discrepancies in the B and D decays? Uh, that's a very good question. I left those out because I, I, in my personal view, they are still to be resolved. I think they're very exciting, and people are very excited about testing whether any of these things are evidence that the standard model has failed. But they're not at the same level of dark matter exists, and we know it's not a standard model particle. That's why I left it out. But, but I think we're all very excited about the prospects of having found evidence in the flavor sector of the charged kind. So we're getting pretty good suddenly these days at building detectors that are big with low background and low energy threshold. And uh, I'm wondering what you think about neutrino magnetic moment searches and how interesting those are. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, one of the fun things about uh, massive neutrinos is, first of all, they can have a magnetic moment. Actually, they must have a magnetic moment because massive particles that, that couple to charge fermions get a magnetic moment. So if you never thought about this, it's kind of fun. And then the other thing that has to happen, by the way, is that the neutrinos have to decay. The heavy ones have to decay into the lightest one. Standard model expectations for the neutrino magnetic moment are unknown because we don't know how neutrinos get a mass, but there's a whole range of things. And if we learn about the neutrino magnetic moment, it would be a big deal because it would probably indicate about new neutrino interactions that we haven't run into yet. There's a lot of interesting work about how large could a neutrino magnetic moment be. And of course, this is theoretical stuff. But there's a, an interesting thing that you can talk about, which is uh, magnetic moments and masses are strongly correlated. If you make the neutrino magnetic moment very large, then all of a sudden, the neutrino mass likes to be pretty large as well. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that this behavior is qualitatively different from Iran and Dirac neutrinos. If the neutrinos are Dirac, this correlation is uh, uh, stronger. If the neutrinos are Majorana, it's not as strong. So one thing people get excited about is that if you found a magnetic moment in a certain range, which is close to the experimental bound and then up by a couple of orders of magnitude, you would be very tempted to believe that the neutrino wants to be a Majorana fermion, for example. That's not a theorem. It's just a strong suspicion. So it's a very, very important thing to look for. It's also very difficult. And studies of solar neutrinos are a good way to do it. Uh, if you could see a magnetic moment in the lab, and people have tried to do that with reactor neutrinos, that would also be a big deal. One way you would do that, by the way, is by doing, say, neutrino electron scattering at very, very low uh, momentum transfers. So I don't know if that's the question, but that's the answer. So, so over on question on this side. Uh, what's the best argument against the Weinberg operator solution? Oh, that, there's no argument. Uh, the, 
the Weinberg operator solution uh, is right as long as lepton number is violated. So the only thing that goes into the Weinberg operator is uh, that lepton number must be violated. So if you believe that lepton number is an exact symmetry of nature, then the Weinberg operator is forbidden, and then it doesn't exist. And then the neutrinos have to be Dirac fermions. If the neutrinos are Majorana fermions and, uh, and the lepton number uh, is violated, then the Weinberg operator will always show up in some form. It may not be useful to describe your phenomenology, but it's always useful to explain the non-zero neutrino masses. Again, that's the, the curse and the benefit of these effective operators, is that they contain some information that's very useful, but they don't contain all the information, and it's even hard to, to know under what circumstances that operator is, is useful. But it's always there. And, and in the case of neutrino masses, because they're so small, uh, it always manifests itself in some way. Okay. Over on the side. So I'm hoping you don't mind sort of a naive question from an introductory physics instructor. Um, I've always thought about that antimatter puzzle as being something that might be solvable by something sort of right under our noses. So for example, the one electron theory kind of helps explain one of those type of puzzles where all electrons have the same charge and they have the same mass, which is very bizarre given the number of electrons that we think are around us, right? So could antimatter be hidden in the universe, for example, in a 50-50 split between matter galaxies and antimatter galaxies? So and people have, yeah, so oh, and part two is um, could antimatter be hidden right in the matter in front of us? For example, an electron is a positron and a proton. So th that's a great question, and uh, we've thought about this a lot, and uh, we've also thought about if that were true, what would be this, the things we would see? And we would see some very spectacular things if that were true. And in particular, and this is way outside of my comfort zone, but I'll say something anyway. One thing you can think about is imagine there's a dark matter galaxy here and a regular matter galaxy there. Let's forget about all the problems. Uh, there will be a transition region where there's matter and antimatter meeting one another every once in a while. What that would lead to is a lot of radiation. We would see radiation every time the antimatter thought about coming close to where the matter is, and we don't see that, let alone all the problems of how does the separation happen and so on. So we're, we, we've thought about these simple ideas, uh, and we've ruled them out. That's why, that's why we think that's a question. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a question. You know. For the part B, on the small length scale, did the same arguments apply? So uh, for part B, if that were true, our understanding of things would be very, very different. So our understanding, which again, as I said, has been developed for a very long time, does not allow for stuff like that. The antimatter must exist in the form that we talk about. That's not a choice. It's a, it's a direct consequence of the formalism that we use to describe fundamental physics. And because this works so well, we're pretty confident that that's a good description, so we're very confident about how we understand the antimatter. So I think we have time for just one more question since you've been there. You have, you have a question? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So if neutrinos are Dirac fermion, you mentioned a possible symmetry can um, make neutrino masses are very small. So how much we understand about this uh, new symmetry? It seems to me it's very similar to strong CP problem, so maybe we can have some prediction about this. Yeah, people have speculated about that. Uh, they clearly don't have to be related. Sadly, we also know very little about the strong CP problem. We do have solutions to it that we're very happy about, like the Axion solution, which also involves a, a new degree of freedom that, that has a, a, an almost symmetry to it. So, so to, to, to not answer the question, but just to say something more, uh, that's a symmetry that we know what it's doing by preventing the neutrino yuka coupling, and, and we want to ascribe that to a property of the, what we call the right-handed neutrino field. We have no idea what else this other symmetry could be doing for us. It could have something to do with the strong CP problem. It could have something to do with the dark matter. Again, one thing that theorists like to do is to solve more than one problem with the same idea because we like to be economical. So these are the types of questions that we're asking. But we certainly don't have any definitive, this must be true kind of answer. OK, so I, I know we have another question, but I think we have to move on and can ask question after the session. So let's thank on, on again. Thank you.